<laughs> from 10 to 12. Emma, you're back. I'm back. Sorry, guys. I've connected to a different Wi-Fi now. I hope it's less unstable. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi. Like, seriously? Not the day of all days. It's just a bit of extra fun. <laughs> it, it actually, I, I got, like it completely kicked me out. So now it's converting that video. So I've recorded again. Um, oh, sorry, Emma, are the videos converting on your side? So it looks like it is. Okay. okay, well, let me just go back in here. You guys can still see my screen? Yeah. Is, is, am I moving on it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, cool. So let's look at the dysfunctions. Okay. Any questions? Um, you guys still fine? Is this going like over your head? Do you see that it's like something you can understand? Great. <laughs> Great to me. <laughs> okay. Um, very interesting. I love this. Okay, great. I'm I'm very glad. Okay. <laughs> My Wi-Fi is definitely dysfunctional. Okay. Um, okay. So let's look at vaginal symptoms. So in a female, you'll get vaginal symptoms, um, something like pelvic organ prolapse, but this can also happen to males, um, especially, um, I, I don't know how to say this correctly. In, it happens to males. I just don't know how to say it correctly, so I'd rather not say it. Um, but it can happen, so please just um, be aware. <laughs> okay, so um, then other symptoms, pain within the vagina, bad Um dyspareunia, which basically just means pain during sex, and vulvodynia. So you don't need to know these big names, but I just want you to understand that there's actually so many symptoms that can happen. Um, and if you do want to know more about this, you're always welcome to ask me. But for time purposes, we've only got half an hour left, so I'm not going to go into depth with it. But basically, vaginismus is, you get different grades of it, but it can be also be pain during sex, but it can actually also be literally that you cannot even penetrate, like a closed off vagina. Um, and though very psychological, um, it's very interesting. Okay. So um, then, yes, for those, you raise the hand. Yeah, Emma, can I ask you how does this, uh, I might be totally off track here, but mm -hmm. I'm thinking about FGM and when, when there has been a case of FGM and how does this relate to, you know, like we talk about a closed vagina and FGM ladies, is it? Have you seen, would FGM cause pelvic dysfunction? Sorry, I'm just talking. Oh, for sure. As far as I understand, they, um, it depends on what they do, but um, isn't that like when they um, remove the clitoris yeah. or the, the first, the initial part of the clitoris? So, yes, you can have, I mean, how is it being done? Like you can have so much scarring, so you can have so much pain. The clitoris has got... Uh, 8,000 to 9,000 nerve ending, endings. And remember that the little bit of the clitoris that you see is not the clitoris itself. It's the most intricate, most amazing structure that lies on the inside. Also, a whole leg on itself, guys. <laughs> but yeah, I, it, I do think um, there will definitely be some sort of, uh, of dysfunction. Um, and I only, you know, I, I work together um, closely with a whole team of people. A physiotherapist is not the only one that works with when it comes to um, trauma and those type of things. We work with um, lots of um, psychologists and sexologists and like very, very intricate team. And there's quite a nice one in Doburg. It's called the My Sexual Health um, Group. And it's a very nice interreferral network that I have um, but yeah, it, like you could definitely, but I hope I've answered you. Yeah. Is that the group that, uh, do, uh, is a Dr. Elna Rudolph on that? Group? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
Okay, so then let's look at pain. Chronic pelvic pain, pelvic pain syndrome, lower back pain, any other musculoskeletal problems can be related to pelvic floor dysfunction. How surprising, right? Um, this is this is interesting. Um, pelvic pain syndrome, um, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm going into the bladder here. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, bladder pain syndrome, interstitial cystitis. Like a lot of interstitial cystitis is actually linked to um, to pelvic floor dysfunction. But even um, if you struggle with in, um, with endo endometriosis, um, you you would really do well with seeing a pelvic floor physio. But you know you will have pelvic floor dysfunction due to that and due to the pain and the chronic pain um okay sexual dysfunction in women we've spoken about the dyspareunia of the vaginismus in men erectile or ejaculatory dysfunction and in both orgasmic dysfunctions can be linked to pelvic floor dysfunction um then if we look at the lower urinary tract symptoms so also the bladder like i can have a whole lecture just on the bladder and how intricate it is and how we actually need to look after our bladders from an early age so that we don't struggle when we're older because the bladder is so linked to your brain. It's got the most intricate feedback loop. Um, and you know, we, we are terrible to our bladders and the bladder and the, how the bladder works is linked to the pelvic floor. So if you have urinary incontinence, urgency or frequency incontinence, incontinence means you, um, you pee in your pants a little bit. Um, so you get lots of different types. So you get stress incontinence, and that's usually when you puff or you sneeze or you jump or something and oops, ooh, pee a little bit or maybe pee a lot. Urgency and frequency. Um, urgency is like you see your house or you're driving to your house and you're like, oh my gosh, I can actually not hold my wee anymore. And just before you like put your pee in the door, you've already beat your pants. And this doesn't necessarily happen to younger people, this only gets triggered later on. You know, we still have some sort of a function to try and hold it. But, you know, if we practice proper toileting techniques now on, like we, we won't struggle like this. Frequency, you've just peed, you stand up, you're like, oh my gosh, I need to pee again. You pee again, you stand up. You're like, what? How can I need to pee again? So you sit down again. So that would be like frequency, incomplete, emptying, same thing, the standing up, it's not done, but it felt like it was done. Um, slow or intermittent stream or straining. Men, men struggle with this. Um, can also be due to prostate problems, but um, definitely interlinked. And then bladder prolapse. So remember, I said prolapse is when an organ moves into the space of another organ. So usually in women, because the vagina is quite a larger structure, other organs might move into its space. And you might even see the protruding organ. You, it's, you're not actually looking at the organ itself. You're looking at like the inside of the vagina that is kind of bulging out. But, you know, lots of women struggle with this and they don't talk about it because who, like, who will bring it up in conversation? Hi, I'm Emma. I have a product. <laughs> I wish we would, though, because it would be so much more understanding. So um, then you get bowel symptoms, so fecal incontinence, functional constipation or obstructed defecation, um, rectal and anal prolapses. Um, so in men, that's where prolapse would happen, um, recto, rectally, anally. Um, but in women, more often than not, it's, it's into the vagina, but not always. It can also be um, rectally. So, um, yeah, constipation. If you're someone who struggles with chronic constipation, you might actually have a pelvic floor dysfunction. Okay. Um, so what influences these dysfunctions? We've mentioned this before. Age, bad habits, weak pelvic floors, physical changes, um, decrease in estrogen if you're a woman, surgery. So this is where all of my issues started. It's post my hip surgery. Um, actually pre my hip surgery and then post it. So I struggle with a little bit of stress incontinence and or have struggled with it and um, pain during sex, not normal. 
it's not okay. <laughs> Nobody likes that. Um, your occupation, like I said, those highly stressed individuals actually use their pelvic floor to hold on and just to make it through the day or make it through the term or whatever they need to do because otherwise they'll literally break down. <laughs> so childbearing um, also changes a lot of things. If you're carrying a little bit of extra weight, remember we spoke about the pressure system and how it needs to be maintained. And if there's been surgery or you're pregnant or you're carrying all that extra weight, um, you struggle with constipation, you know, all of these things change those pressure systems which places a lot of strain on the pelvic floor, which can either make it weaker or make it tighter and weaker okay high impact activities yes the dose sorry i just one more question um when you have a i don't know how to say it is it an in in junior in junior hernia hernia yeah. or, is that a pelvic floor um is it caused by pelvic floor dysfunction or is it a result of pelvic floor dysfunction uh it can be but it's um you know, everybody is so completely different. There can be so many other factors that also play a role. But if you look at a pressure system, and a hernia is usually due to there's a weakened spot within, and um, there's pressure on it, and that's why it happens. So it can be. Um, I'm not saying everyone with a hernia, hernia will have a um, pelvic floor dysfunction, but um, definitely a lot will. <laughs> Mm, yeah, why sense. do you struggle with it no uh, I knew somebody who did and so it's just um, yeah like I mean I don't know that much about it but I became interested in it yeah yeah it also depends on how big it is whether people fix it or not or where it is if it's painful you know those type of things um, okay yeah heavy lifting um, weight lifters crossfitters um, if you have chronic disease or injuries, foods. So we know there's so many bladder irritants and those can also play a role in how the pelvic floor works. Um, okay. Okay, so let's get a little bit into cueing. So remember what I said, pelvic floor needs to be able to fully relax and fully contract. And I need to be able to work on demand. And you can see I didn't even finish the slide. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it basically needs endurance. <laughs> I don't know why I put the and in there. Um, so I want you guys to do something for me. So we're going to work on a little bit of pelvic floor contraction now. Um, so how the pelvic floor contraction, remember we've got three layers. So we actually want to target all three of them. And um, that's what we're basically going to do right now. And I want you to focus on not using any of your other muscles, other muscles being your glutes. I don't want your glutes to contract. I don't want you to kind of lift higher in your seat when you're doing this if you are sitting. Um, I don't mind if your tummy muscles flatten, but I don't want them to bulge. Okay. So remember that transverse abdominal muscle that we spoke about? that part of the core that, that, that makes up that cylinder, that muscle is supposed to flatten. And it works very closely with the pelvic floor. So our pelvic floor activates as we exhale. Okay, because as we exhale, the diaphragm flattens, air moves out of the lungs, the whole cylinder moves up. Okay, so that's how I want you to start to activate it. It's a secret. Like nobody's supposed to know that you're busy contracting your pelvic floor. So we can start with, you know that feeling when you really have a fart and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't do this now, I'm in a plane, or somebody's going to hear me. So that feeling of really naping, okay, that's a nice Afrikaans word for, <laughs> for the day. So really holding um, into what we call an anal wick, okay. So I want you to try that first. So see if you can get it right. So imagine, oh my gosh, I'm like, I wish I could see all of your faces doing this. This would be great. <laughs> so that's what I want you to try and start to do. So we're going to exhale and see if you can hold or do a little bit of an anal wink. 
and see how it feels. Is it easy? Is it hard? Do you know where your anus is? Is it <laughs> so that that's what I want you to try initially. Then next, what I want you to do is maybe do the anal wink, but I want you to imagine that you're squeezing your vagina closed as well. And remember, every time you're doing this on an exhale, tummy is flattening, pelvic floor is moving up. Okay, glutes are relaxed, hamstrings are relaxed, quads are relaxed. You're not holding your shoulders up here. Find, just find a nice comfortable seat wherever you, you can chill a little bit. Okay, so next what I want you to try and do is with the anal wink and with the vaginal squeezing, I want you to see if you can hold a wee. Okay, we never hold a wee on the toilet. But that feeling of having to, oh, I need to hold my wee, that's the feeling of that kind of urethral, that sphincter closing. Okay. You never hold a wee on the loo. That's not how you do pelvic floor exercises. That confuses your poor bladder and that causes more damage than good. Okay. So we started with the back, then we did vagina. Ashton, not you, like you ignore the vagina. And then we hold the we. Okay. So basically, all three of them happen together. Okay. But it moves technically, if we look at how they contract, the anal wink usually happens first. So I'm explaining it to you like this because I want you to understand the intricacies of it. When we explain this to someone, when we cue for Mula Banda, we don't say, do an anal wink, then you do this, then you do this. We usually say, contract the pelvic floor or breathe out and, you know, um, I don't know what cues you would use, but, you know, those are um, the type of things that we say. But I just want you to understand, I want you to try this contraction. Okay. Have you done it? Give me some feedback. Is it easy? Is it hard? Are you getting it? Do you know where everything is? Anybody? I feel like I'm all alone here. Oh, hi, Caro. Oh, Janine, sorry. As I can't see you all wet. Yes, Caro, go first. Um. I, um, I, I used to use this like hold your pee analogy a lot until I found out that actually quite a few people have no connection to that sensation. And I'm talking like across genders. So I found that just interesting that this, so uh, what I'm trying to understand right now, are you giving different, um, ways to contract the pelvic floor or is it kind of like happening in succession in a way like all these are part of the pelvic floor yeah so i am just so what i'm doing right now is i just want you guys to try it so that's basically how it happens in succession and a lot of the people i i, th I think i find it very interesting that you just said a lot of people actually don't understand that holding the wee part but that's just basically the front part your pelvic floor you saw how big it is right so, it, it, that kind of contact and that anal wink, feeling the vagina being pulled up, feeling that holding the wheat up, that's how it happens in succession. But that's not how we're going to cue, right? Because lots of people don't understand these cues. So I'm going to give you some of the cues that I used just now. But I wanted you to try it now because I want you to see if, if it like makes sense. When I, when I initially at a course and I had to try and contract my pelvic floor. Like I cannot contract the front part. Like I cannot hold a wee. Like I feel completely lost. I suddenly start breathing funny. I can't, I have, I don't have that. Um, the co-activation is like completely lost on me. So yeah, I want to know if it's easy for you guys to contract your pelvic floor or if you find it difficult. Does your breath change when you try and do it? You feel like you're holding on. You feel like your glutes want to contract. Anybody else? 
<laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, I, I just tried the, the the front part again, and for me, it's the same. Like it's the, the anal winking uh, comes pretty easily. Mm. And the more I move to the front, it feels not necessarily like it's hard, but it feels like it's yeah moving more into the breath or kind of like a funny sensation where you're like, do you do I want to hold that? Yeah. <laughs> almost, almost like ticklish and like but but not exactly just don't know how to describe this yeah it is weird <laughs> i mean do you want to say something i can't hear you you're you're on mute <laughs> sorry no, I, I feel the same terror with this one i mean i can do it it is it is easy to think about it but i also do hold my breath and it's also a weird, it's a weird sensation. Yeah. So when we hold our breath, it can, it changes the, the pressure system, right? So if we're teaching someone to hold their, or to activate their pelvic floor, and they are doing breath holding, they're actually placing a lot of pressure on that pelvic floor. And we don't know, if we're looking at our yoga class, we don't know who's had surgery, who has a prolapse, who, who, who. We don't know these things because we can't see it. So... You know, I'm, I'm bringing this in because I want us to, I want us to cue this. I want you guys to play around with bringing this into your class, but I want you to do it correctly. And I, and I want, you know, I, I want everybody who has a pelvis to have a proper functioning pelvic floor. <laughs> Does anybody else want to say anything? Everybody, I know your videos are all for me. Um, is my internet connection okay? Is, have I broken up a bit? Not at all. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. So, yeah, maybe and if you want to show me your face, maybe show me your contraction. <laughs> yes. I actually find that in practice because I can't do it without holding my breath. The front part, not the not the back part. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. I, like I mean, they say again. Almost like light headed. Okay. That's, that's very interesting. And I think, um, I think if we look at um, Ava's lectures, I think it will also be quite interesting to see how the nervous system plays a role in this, right? Um, we know that the nervous system is linked to breathing. And um, as a pelvic floor physio, we've actually, you know, my, my teacher on pelvic floor um, is very much into what do I call it? She's like a, a coach. I can't remember what coach she is, but like a mindfulness coach and all of those things. And she talks a lot about the traumas and the, you know, our childhood years that we actually hold in our pelvis. Now, whether this comes from, I don't know, chakra system or some system that Emma's not very aware about, I'm not sure. But I believe in it. Because of what I've seen, and because of what I've seen when I treat patients. So it's interesting, you know, and a lot of the time it's also a lack of awareness. If we don't have the awareness around it, it's hard for us to contract it. I still struggle to contract the front part. And when, if I recall, when I was a child, I had some sort of a bladder surgery. I don't know what or what it was, but I had to quite put catheterize me, pump my bladder full, take it out. And I'm telling you that's where my problem started. <laughs> so, Karen, did you want to say something? Are you just showing me your face? <laughs> Great, thanks. Okay, cool. So let's move on. If there's nothing else you want to say, um, let's move on. So we spoke a little bit about the different types of contractions and that we get, um, you know, we, uh, we've got that 70% that is a, a stabilizer that has endurance that needs to be able to hold things and then the 30% that needs to be able to do things quickly, okay, and that doesn't have endurance. So to practice pelvic floor correctly and to practice um, its function correctly, we need to be able to um, attract and fully relax and do that a few times. We need to be able to contract and hold for up to 10 seconds. We need to be able to contract and relax as fast as we can. You know, these are all the things that we don't practice in a class, right? 
I don't know if you have ever. You know, this is how the pelvic floor works. It works in different ways. And it doesn't just work when we're sitting, right? It's working when we're walking, when we're going upstairs, when we're squatting, when we're busy with our yoga class, it's working, you know? Um, so think about the different positions that you ask people to contract their pelvic floor in. It's not just lying down on your back, visualizing that type of thing. So yeah, I just speak a little bit about this endurance and the strength and the stuff. Sorry, I haven't been looking at the chats. I like this, the pelvic floor gymnastics. Is that where they learn how to like blow bubbles and stuff? <laughs> or does that only ha ha happen in Thailand? <laughs> It's, it's really what you asked us uh, to do. Uh, I was just once in one of these classes because I thought it might be uh, sen sensible to do that when I was pregnant, just to get a little bit of control. And, and they, they instruct you to do these kind of things, also like the contracting and holding for 10 seconds and the relaxing and the fast um, thing, contracting and relaxing. So it's, it's, I, I think it's been about... 15 years ago or so that and it was really, really, really popular and it was in every magazine and you just had to go to Beckenboden gymnastic to uh, pelvic floor gymnastics. And, and, and it, was, it was at the same time when this book about urine, drinking your own urine and things like that was popular. So no one was really afraid to talk about that, at least in like where I lived. So it was, it's funny, it, it, it disappeared a little bit now. Hmm. So that, that is interesting, and I think in a cultural perspective, like in South Africa, we, I, I mean, I'm talking, I'm, like, I'm talking not for the whole of South Africa, but for the way I was raised, um, as a, a Christian, you know, sex before marriage is like completely taboo, um, what is your vagina, yeah, it's maybe it's down there, it's one of the holes, you know, that type of thing. Um, it's not something we speak about a lot. Like we, like what, who, other floor contraction? Like that would, I've never discussed that. And my friends that I grew up with and that I spent time with are quite the same. It was like quite a taboo subject. Um, and yeah, I, I, culturally it, it does differ, but what we find, and actually there's a lot of research that my, um, my colleague Alma Rudolf, who is the sexologist doctor, that started this my sexual health thing. She says that about um, eighty percent of her um, uh, eighty percent of her sexual pain patients come from a religious background, which I think is very interesting. And I mean, we're working here in South Africa, so that's a that's quite an interesting thing. That you know, way back when it was like, cool, <laughs> let's let's do the vagina gymnastics. I should start that movement here. Okay, so um, I'm so completely running out of time. I told you I talk way too much. So um, here are some cues for you. So I, you, well, I thought, wow, wow, I can't speak. I thought we can discuss this together. Um, how you think the practice of Mula Bandha, you know, is there a role for it in your yoga class? Or, um, you know, how you would, you, you would bring it in. Would you bring it in? Is this something you are interested in? That type of thing. You know, I thought we could make a discussion about it because personally, I haven't, no, I have been to one class where somebody did cue it. And the way she cued it, I was actually very impressed with her because she just brought awareness to it. She didn't tell me what I need to be doing and how I need to be doing, but she, she brought awareness to it. And I think that was quite a nice thing, especially for someone who's never heard of the pelvic floor. Understand that there is one and that it plays a role. Um, but otherwise, I've never been in, in you know, um, yeah, I've never been in a class where somebody like cued Mulabanda or cued it incorrectly and probably... Um, and probably tell them it's wrong. <laughs> but anyway, some cues that I like to use is um, to bring awareness to the pelvic floor by calling it a zip. So starting from the back of your tailbone, zipping it all the way to the front, to your pubic bone. And you can start with that kind of, um, you can say, okay, the zip is open when you relax, and as you, as you contract it, 
the zip closes, okay? Does that make sense? I like that one. That one works a little bit, especially if you want to bring more awareness on, on the, the anal wing, the vagina, the bladder. Otherwise, um, just making more of a general contraction in a class. I've put the picture in. This is my pelvis, my, me debuting my pelvis picture. That was my smoothie, and it was very nice. So you can talk about, I call them milkshakes. So, and my, my clients like, like the milkshake analogy. So imagining that your favorite milkshake or like your the thickest milkshake you've ever seen with a nice thick straw and imagining drawing that milkshake up with a contraction with your vagina. Okay. How cool. <laughs> like you are all doing it right now. Don't lie. <laughs> So the next one, and I don't know why we have this link to food, but um, blueberries, maybe even frozen blueberries because you don't want to squish them. So hard little blueberries, and you're picking them up off the floor with your vagina. No, you're not squatting and picking them up. It's all like visualizations. You're picking them up and you're holding it there. You don't want to drop it, but you still want to breathe normally. And then um, inhale, relaxing. Dropping it down very lightly, very not just dropping them down, like placing it down beautifully. Does that make sense? Okay, then the elevator. Um, so the elevator is also a nice one if you want to work a little bit more on like that transverse abdominus contraction that also happens when the pelvic floor contracts. So you can say you imagine that um, the bottom of, I'm talking a lot about the vagina, but remember in men this can be, the perineum, the space between where scrotum is and the, um, the anus is, that's the perineum. So you can talk about that as well, right? But if you imagine there's an elevator and ground floor is right at the bottom. So it's at the, um, at the vaginal entrance or um, um, at the perineum. Um, as you contract, that elevator slowly starts to move all the way up towards your belly button. And you can actually even play around with stopping it, like moving it up. Let's so the elevator stopping on floor number one, but it's on its way to floor number 10. Okay, so then slowly moving up all the way with that contraction. That's also a really nice one to do. Um, the other one that I've heard of is like a water ripple. So, you know, when you drop a pebble in water and it ripples, Imagine dropping it in, it ripples, it relaxes, and as you contract your pelvic floor, you move that all the way back up. This one doesn't sit well with me. It's just some people like it. I don't like explaining it. An octopus, an octopus's tentacles are opening up, and then they close up and draw back in. I mean, you, there's so many different cues that you can use. As long as you know that you need to be able to relax the pelvic floor and it's just as important as contracting it. Okay. <laughs> Shame, Kara. Um, sorry. I we basically, guys, if you need to hop off, please hop off. Um, I all I have is a little bit of more of research, and we don't have to discuss this. I can send this to you. Um, you can see I love talking about research, and then. Yeah, we can just discuss if you think pelvic floor, if there's a place for for Mulabanda in um, in yoga. Yeah, Ava, trying to bring the sit bones and pubic bones in a density together. Absolutely. My only concern is many a person doesn't actually know about where the sit bones or where the pubic bone is. So maybe bringing a lot of awareness around that is also a, a great idea. Um, so, yeah, um, unmute yourselves, tell me what you think. I'm not going to talk much um, longer because it, it's, I think I only had till two, right? I told you I talked too much. Okay, so tell me what do you think? Do you think there's place for this? Do you think we should be queuing Mulabanda? And is Mulabanda different to a normal pelvic floor contraction? Anybody? Unmute yourself and tell me. I, I um, hearing about what you talked about with the um, with a chance to relax the pelvic floor. Um, if you 
teach Mulaban. I'm not, uh, I'm not teaching these things, but I think it, it would make sense to not have it like it, it is often taught to, to have it on the whole time. Mm. But then the relaxation part, then it's more in, like into the direction of the ballerina instead of, and you are contracting the whole time, like more the stress part and, and not the relaxation part. So I think if, if it's taught, it should not only be taught to be on, but also to be off. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. Um, I, no, like I said, I, I haven't really been in a class where they cue it all the time, but I like thinking back to my ballet years, it was cued actually <laughs> on all the time. So yeah. Um, is it something, Ava, is it something that you'd, you'd do now after this lecture, something that you'd try to bring into a class? Um, actually, I, um, I have brought in things like that, not, not that specifically, but I, a lot of time I'm not doing it, bringing it into like the active part of the class but into uh, the more relaxation part of the class where I where I also work with how the diaphragm moves to bring awareness there and to mirror the same movement with a pelvic floor somehow because when the like because they are they are moving like a current together so the one goes down the other one goes down as well one is relaxing one is contracting in that in that case but it's still they are moving the same direction the whole time so like to visualize the the content of the abdomen um, staying more or less the same so that you don't have to bulge your, your, your belly out too much so that the space that the diaphragm takes is given by the pelvic floor and the other way around. So I try to, to visualize that a little bit in, 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 like in the relaxation phases and, and things like that. Okay, beautiful. That actually sounds amazing. I should come to one of your classes. <laughs> you wouldn't understand because I only teach in German. I have so much difficulty teaching English. How do you not know I cannot speak German? <laughs> ah, that's cool. Then you can. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Very, I can understand very little because my dad, my gran came from the then Czechoslovakia. So she spoke German and um, my dad grew up in German. I went to German school. <laughs> But I, I'm joking, like I really actually only have to understand very little. <laughs> and probably not the type of German you speak. Like I'll understand South African German. <laughs> okay. And I also what I do is like the, the transverse abdominals, I try to teach that in movement. So the stabilizing function that you talked about, like in all the flows where I, where I go from one pose to another pose, I try to really starting at the beginning of class in just lying on my back to to bring awareness to that not that excessively drawing in all the abdominal muscles but just you know activating the core that you talked about so just the stabilizers which which bring um, the control in to um, movement yeah okay awesome thanks um Ava. Does anybody else want to say anything what do they think and remember, you're welcome to pop off if you need to. I told you I talked so much. <laughs> yes, Karen. Um, I just wanted to know, I, I would love to hear how you kind of bring it into your practice and your classes. Um, queuing, I know, like you said, queuing wise that you've mentioned, but um, like whereabouts in your movement or whereabouts would you bring it in? So... So I, so I don't teach group classes. I used to have a group class um, at the practice. Um, actually, I used to have it somewhere else and then they closed that studio down. So I started a small little group class at the practice and it hardly hit the ground before COVID happened. So I only teach privates um, and I see, I, you know, I bring it into a lot of the work that I do with patients. So as a the pelvic floor physio, I actually... Um, do internal assessments because that's the only way you can truly know if a pelvic floor is too tight or too weak. So I do internal assessments where we actually contract, for instance, around my finger and um, I can feel if the pelvic floor is tight, you know, those type of things. So I bring it into my private sessions a lot more. And a lot of the time we actually start in a very relaxed state. So it's usually lying down on your back, um, I'll bring in a visualization that resonates with my patient 
experiences, you know, so it, it depends. So I haven't ever taught it to a large group of people. Um, no, have I? I did at a workshop once, but yeah, I basically, I pick a cue that I'm comfortable teaching and that's um, uh, the elevator one or that's that milkshake one. I don't know why people just get the milkshake. <laughs> yeah, I like um, that one. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I make them first start doing it in a comfortable position. So usually that's an anti-gravity position. By no means is that the only way we need to practice this because that just allows the, you know, people, I mean, we know that people are like completely not in, in their bodies. They are in their minds. And we practice yoga to move, get out of our mind and into our body. So... Um, a lot of the time that what we're actually working on is bringing people into their bodies and understanding how it moves. So, yeah, I don't know if I really um, answered you. <laughs> no, yeah, thanks. I just wanted to know ex am I, yeah, exactly that, um, whether it's kind of something you could do in a, in a public class with a whole group of people. Because, as you say, so many people are in a different um in different mindsets of awareness in their body. So it just could be super interesting. Someone might just click straight away in the milkshake thing or, and others might just completely go over their head. And yeah. so I was just wondering. Interesting. So, I mean, I think it would be so nice to bring it into a class, but maybe just starting bringing awareness around it. This is your, your pelvic floor. There's a bowl that lies at the base of your pelvis. Imagine swirling some water in that bowl and the water is yeah. swirling and, you know, like things like that, you know, now letting the water drip out, now letting the water come back in, something like that. I just made that up. I don't know. But like, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think it'd be so nice to do that. But what, what I guess, and that's what um, Ava also mentioned, it's not like what I guess we don't want people to do is to contract Mulabanda and hold it there, the whole class, mm. and where's your Mulabanda? Are you holding it? Are you doing this? Are you doing this? you know, working on the relaxation as well. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you. That, that's so interesting. <laughs> you, never, you never hear that, like the relaxation part. Yeah. Okay. So, guys, does anybody else want to say anything? I mean, I am here at your disposal until, unless they've booked a patient for me, which I hope not, until three. <laughs> So if anybody wants to say anything else, otherwise you are welcome to hop off. I'm going to stay on just a little bit if you want to talk to me. And you're always welcome to private message me. I'm happy for anything. And I'll send you the notes if you want it. <laughs> okay, I'll send it to you in PDA form. Just excuse my spelling mistakes. Okay, it says yes. Sure thing. Pleasure. Yeah, so, hmm? This is really awesome. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. Does it link well to your doula stuff? No, no, it does. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't practice anymore. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's important to bring the awareness in to our classes. And I mean, even if it's done before Shavasana, it's also quite a good time because everybody's lying down, they're relaxed. Mm, absolutely. Um, time to think about it maybe, or not. Mm. <laughs> you know, uh, that's where I would possibly bring it in. And maybe at the beginning as well. Yeah. So that's so actually very nice. And the relaxing part of the pelvis at the end. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, and I think what's also nice is, you know, we see lots of people and maybe we bring this into a class and then somebody comes back and says, listen, I, I don't quite get it and, and I don't quite know what you mean with that. And that's, you know, that's your opportunity to say, great, we can work a little bit more on it or let me refer you to someone who can help you, right? And that's where pelvic floor physios come in, okay? I've I mean, got a friend. One mm -hmm. of my clients on Friday after the class came up to me and said, Jan, I'm weeing in my pants when I jump on the trampoline at home. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she's now, she wants to go for an up and... No. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> oh, shame. Thanks, Ashton. Sorry, I'm going to respond now. Thanks, Ashton. Sorry, it was lots of vagina talk, but that's me. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll do all the peeny talks. <laughs> um, Deneen, 
Uh, yes. She needs to see a. Um, she needs to go see a physio first. You know what? Even if you go for these ops, like even if you have a prolapse and you go for an op, it doesn't necessarily take your symptoms away. It doesn't. Okay. Remember, bladder is an intricate, like super super intricate system organ. No, you can be, you can have urinary incontinence and, 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 and have a prolapse and you go for prolapse surgery. It's not going to fix your urinary incontinence. Your muscles are still weak, but they don't fix your muscles. They literally take a mesh, mesh it all up, you know, and you, like also if you've had a hysterectomy, like you've created this massive gap in that whole pelvic system. So You've got this gap. I'm going to probably stop sharing screen. Oh, no. Stop. Okay. So um, if there's this gap, then suddenly the, these organs can move into the other spaces. So, yeah, like surgery is, surgery is not always the answer. It's, surgery is the last resort. Physio is a conservative management, but also prehab and post Ab. <laughs> Rehab. <laughs> Why am I struggling today? <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah, is there something else that it's, it's good that women talk about these things because I think a lot of women don't don't talk about it. You're too shy to talk about it. You know, mm. oh my gosh, I'm 49 and I'm my pets. Yeah. No, I'm... I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm 28 and I wee in my pants. How's that? <laughs> but that's the thing. Like when you're older, people don't like. People are like, "Oh well, it happens," and that's why you have nappies and all of those things. <laughs> that's um, that's not my first uh, thought. <laughs> you know, I'm young and I'm struggling with sexual pain where I never used to. Like that's like what? That's not okay. And people are like, "Oh." When you have babies, or your, your sex is always a little bit sore. I mean, please, it's supposed to be the nicest thing you do. Like, why, why should it be sore? I hear you on that one. I mean, I'm completely, you know, I hear you on that one. I'm completely dysfunctional in that aspect of my life. It just, nothing goes there. It's impossible. <laughs> Okay, I've come in at a, at a bad moment there, but I just came to say I've got and, um, a couple of... Uh, Ashton's gone, otherwise I wouldn't have said this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to just leave this open if you guys want to keep chatting and then when I see you all gone, I'll close it. I've just got a couple of calls I have to get onto. Definitely. Um, I can also, can I end it? Oh, I can. Okay. I'm, sure, I'm sure you can do whatever you want and um, if you need help with the recording, just let me know. Okay, I will. Thanks so much. Sure, um, sure. I Thanks mean, so I'm much. still... I'm still on here until um, everybody leaves. So you guys are welcome to ask my question or you can message me privately. I've got a patient, I've got a private client at three. That's all. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, thanks. And I found it a bit squeamy, but mm. I, I think yeah. as you mentioned, like it's a cultural thing, you know, mm -hmm. so like grew up where, you know, you're, you didn't really talk about that sort of stuff. No, for sure. I, you know what? I I should actually come with a warning hazard. Yeah, if you give me five seconds, I'll start talking about my vagina. So, <laughs> so say again. Maybe we should turn off the recording now. <laughs> oh, I don't mind. <laughs> Pause, record, okay, guys. Stop.